All right. Hello, everyone. I think we are about ready to get started with our second to last panel of the day, which is the use of textual records for film research. I should note that after this is our closing workshops on how to use the records of the National Archives for film research. I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat so that we have a couple YouTube videos that we'd like you to watch if you're going to that next session beforehand during the break, and I will put those links in the chat during these presentations. So I'm Brian Real. I'm an assistant professor of information and library science at Southern Connecticut State University. I have an MLS and PhD in information studies from the University of Maryland, which is why I used to be right by National Archives College Park and where I started my research. We're I'm going to be the last presenter on this panel today, but I want to give you a quick introduction to our other panelists. First up, we will have Nathaniel Brennan, who is a PhD candidate at NYU. His research focuses on the social, cultural, and intellectual histories of cinema in the United States during the first half of the 20th century. His dissertation, which is nearing completion, explores the collaboration between the Museum of Modern Art Film Library and the federal government to derive useful intelligence from captured enemy cinema during World War II. It also seems worth mentioning that Nate has a chapter in the wonderful edited volume, Cinema's Military Industrial Complex, which also features several of our other presenters from this conference. Since it seems like the type of thing that would be of interest to our current audience, I'll drop a link in the chat momentarily. After Nate, we'll have Charles Bucky Grimm. Bucky is an independent film researcher with over 40 years of experience examining various facets of the motion picture industry, specializing in the silent era. His main areas of interest are related to early film preservation efforts, early government sponsored filmmaking, and currently he is working to document the lives and careers of cameramen and camera women active during the silent era. Then we will have Jenny Horn, who is an associate professor of film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz, specializing in American non-theatrical film history. In particular, Dr. Horn's research concerns the use of film for the purposes of citizenship and the state. And she studies this in entities like the American Red Cross, the Department of Labor, and the United States Information Agency. Her forthcoming book, Civic Cinema includes research on notions of film betterment, improvement, and uplift by women's clubs, service organizations, charity groups, government agencies, and public libraries in the early part of the 20th century. The last presentation will be by me, Brian Real. I already introduced myself. But after that, we will switch to a time for discussion where we will have Kate Brennan from the National Archives. Kate Brennan is the subject matter expert archivist for foreign affairs at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. She holds a master's degree in history from the University of Maryland. And I should note that we did not intentionally put Nate Brennan and Kate Brennan on the same panel. So if you have questions throughout, we will take them at the end. Um, you just go to the Q&A box and drop them in there and we'll get to it. So if everybody is ready, we will start the presentations. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for attending our session. My name is Nathaniel Brennan and I'm a doctoral candidate in cinema studies at NYU. Before I begin, I want to express my thanks to the organizers, particularly Brian Reel, for asking me to take part in this conference. The primary focus of my research is the history of film studies as an academic discipline. I'm particularly interested in the years leading up to and including American involvement in the Second World War. I define film studies broadly. The history of film studies involves more than just the use and study of cinema in the classroom. Early interest in cinema developed in the social sciences, much of it funded by phil philanthropies like the Rockefeller Foundation. 
The interests of social scientists were not so much with the aesthetic qualities of film, but in understanding how film as a media affected its audience and how these effects, both positive and negative, could be harnessed. Film studies was also at this stage subsumed under the umbrella of communications research, where the most productive work revolved around education and propaganda. Given the various crises of the 1930s, it is understandable that propaganda and communication research would be of greater urgency in the years leading up to World War II. This was a crucible moment for film and media studies, and there are many avenues of fruitful research to explore. But what I will be talking about today has to do with one of the most common challenges faced by anyone coming to study film, access. Film studies, of course, needs actual films to study. Generations of scholars have bemoaned lack of access to most of the field's history, either because of censorship, copyright, neglect, or absence. But for one particular phase of propaganda research during World War II, the challenge was the opposite of this. There were too many films, nowhere to store them, and limited professional knowledge about how best to store and retrieve them. Given that the purpose of this conference is to highlight the vast and relatively untapped motion picture resources of the National Archives, I will be discussing a moment when when the challenges of film research were met in a learn-as-you-go manner. To put this most plainly, while most officials in the federal government recognized the propaganda and intelligence value of motion pictures, they needed to improvise practical solutions to make that work possible. What they ended up with was a collection of foreign films, some three million feet of it, suddenly under federal jurisdiction, the remnants and duplicates of which are today kept by the Library of Congress and the National Archives. The Library of Congress refers to this collection as its captured foreign collection of German, Italian, and cinema, and Japanese cinema. Before moving on, we would do well to remember that the apparatus of cinema is rather clumsy. Unlike radio or print, which needs only to be heard or seen, encountered, as it were, in the wild, cinema requires a certain amount of local infrastructure. Putting aside the basic requirements of exhibition, reels of film take up space. They are heavy. They get in the way. And when you have more than two canisters of film, they start to add up. Where did these films come from? Although it is not often remarked in most histories of American film culture, the films shown in the United States between the two world wars were a heterogeneous mixture. It is true that most of these came from the American film industry, but there also existed a network of distributors who specialized in importing films from abroad. Most of Hollywood's major European competitors maintained distribution and publicity offices in New York. By 1940, many of these distributors, both those connected with major concerns and those working independently, maintained warehouses of films imported from abroad. The market for foreign films was a vanishingly small part of the American film market, but foreign films found success among marginalized minority audiences. Films from Sweden appealed to Swedish-American communities in the Midwest, Soviet films played at workers' forums in big cities, smaller concerns targeted audiences in local ethnic enclaves. Of all the different kinds of international films that slowly but steadily flowed into the United States from the mid-1920s to the late 1930s, German cinema was a breed apart. For one thing, German cinema was typically higher quality and had some crossover appeal with art cinema audiences. For this reason, as is well known, Hollywood regularly poached the German film industry's talent. For another, imported German films were popular in German-American neighborhoods where, in some cases, theaters could survive solely on German feature films, newsreels, and shorts. Furthermore, well before the Nazis nationalized the film industry in the mid-1930s, German companies like Ufa and Tobis had established offices in America. In the early 1930s, both of these concerns even had some had enough capital to try their hand at establishing their own theater chains. So, in the late summer of 1941, when the federal government very belatedly froze the bank accounts of businesses operating in the U.S. with direct ties to the Axis powers, they did so after a period of more than a dozen years during which distributors brought hundreds of film prints over to the American market. Shortly after the United States officially entered the war on December 8th, The assets of these companies were seized and liquidated by federal agents from the Treasury and Justice Department. This is where our story begins. Tracking the history of this collection is complicated by the number of agencies involved. First, German, Italian, and Japanese assets were seized beginning in late 1941. This task was carried out by the Customs Bureau and Foreign Funds Control of the Treasury Department and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The administration of foreign 
of frozen foreign assets is itself a complicated matter, but for our purposes it will suffice to say that in the case of film companies, the physical assets, including the films, were taken over by the Treasury, while the FBI, tasked with building conspiracy, sedition, and espionage cases, was interested in corporate filings and correspondence. So immediately the material that was seized went in two separate directions. One aspect of modern bureaucratic organization that remains as true today as it did in 1942 is that agencies ostensibly on the same side often work counter to one another. They reproduce each other's work and sometimes they nurse rivalries. This was particularly true in the case of the Treasury and Justice Departments and was made more apparent when Roosevelt reactivated a First World War era agency known as the Alien Property Custodian, the sole purpose of which was maintaining enemy assets, that is, patents, trademarks, copyright, and property. Henceforth, the office of the APC drafted long lists of these assets that fell under its jurisdiction, known as vesting orders. So far as I have been able to determine, the first vesting order seen here for enemy-owned motion pictures appeared in February 1943. To oversimplify things, the APC cleared the way legally for the use of vested enemy property by other federal agencies, with some exceptions for resale to American business. To quickly run through a list of the war agencies interested in this collection, from the civilian side, there was Nelson Rockefeller's Office of Inter-American Affairs, the purpose of which was to strengthen diplomatic ties between the Americas. There was also the Office of War Information, tasked with performing many of the same tasks in the name of domestic morale. In the intelligence community, the RNA division of the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the modern CIA, wrote confidential memoranda on the strategies of Nazi newsreels and radio propaganda in order to make American propaganda and psychological warfare more effective. But it was the War Department, particularly the Signal Corps, which actually commandeered most of the films from the APC and seemingly had right of first refusal. This was because the Signal Corps had enlisted Frank Capra to produce a series of orientation films for new soldiers that explained the background of the war known as the Why We Fight series. For this purpose, Capra wanted to use actual films produced by the enemy, and so he got them. So now we have supply and demand, but not the infrastructure necessary to provide one to the other. The Alien Property Custodian was essentially a legal office. Storage and maintenance of physical assets had to be outsourced. I don't want to suggest that the government had not prior to this point engaged in the handling and storage of motion pictures, but it was under-equipped under for the task during the war. Naturally, the APC turned to the Library of Congress, which already had working relationship with the relationships with organizations in the private sector, the most important of which was the Museum of Modern Art Film Library. The film library staff had a level of expertise that the APC and Library of Con Congress could not match. And so, the film library became a third partner in developing strategies to catalog and store the captured films. Over the next three years, innumerable containers of film reels Shipping invoices and vesting orders circulated among these agencies. The films, when not being used by Capra, first in Washington, D.C. and later in Los Angeles, were stored at the Museum of Modern Art, in rented vaults, and in spaces provided by the National Archives at Fort Hunt, Virginia. Now, if I could emphasize anything that these operations, it would be how complex and frequently chaotic they were. The films themselves, some of which had been in deep storage well before the war, were in various stages of disrepair, which we can see in the following photograph taken in the early 1950s. To make matters worse, Library of Congress staff soon discovered that much of their vault space was inadequate for film storage, and there was the problem of new accessions. To give you an impression of these challenges, I quote from an exasperated memorandum from the Library of Congress's Keeper of the Collection, dated September 16, 1944, concerning an unexpected arrival the previous day of a truck loaded with nitrate films. I quote, It seems that Mr. Howard Walls had been advised the day before by APC that the library would use the facilities of the Army War College Film Laboratory for inventory purposes. I had had no such knowledge of, an, of this arrangement. When Mr. Walls arrived at the Army War College sometime in the afternoon, the said laboratory was found to be on the third floor without elevator facilities, and the cases of films were too heavy to be carried up three flights of stairs, at least so late in the day. Furthermore, I understood that the War College authorities were rather surprised that we were to undertake such operations on a large scale." Unquote. I will end my historical sketch here. There is, of course, much more to the story that future research may illuminate. I hope that one outcome of this conference will be a greater appreciation of the relationship between textual 
and motion picture records, illuminating in particular how the moving image collections of the Library of Congress and the National Archives came to be in the first place. Thank you. Good day. My name is Bucky Grimm, and I'm an independent researcher who looks into various facets of early motion picture history, specifically the silent era. My current area of research is related to cinematographers during this period. This leads directly into the subject I'm going to talk to you about today, the Signal Corps School of Photography during World War I. There's a wealth of material used in my ongoing research, which comes from national archives, both in motion pictures and still photos, some of which you will see today. Some of this material is from Record Group 111-H, which are historical films, many shot by the Signal Corps personnel. There are other 400 reels which have been digitized and are available for you to view online at the National Archives website. Also, many of the still images you will see come from Record Group 111-SC. Many of these are online as well. These images provide a unique glimpse into the activities and training of the Signal Corps personnel, as well as capturing many other Signal Corps activities at the time. The school itself was established on January 1, 1918, after a meeting of the Army War College. The Army felt it was very important to be able to document the activities of soldiers, both in training and in combat. Once the decision was made to develop the photographic unit, the Army mobilized quickly to get this school underway. One of the first orders of business was to find a location for training. Captain J.D. Sears, who was head of the Army Photographic Unit, approached Columbia University in New York about conducting the training there. Arrangements were confirmed, and the school was ready for the onslaught of recruits. Also, current facilities had to be converted and readied for areas of film developing, storage, and also housing recruits. It was decided to use Havemeyer Hall as the area for instruction, as it was the chemical building for the university and as such was already partly outfitted for the needs of the Signal Corps School. The presentation that follows will provide a brief overview of some of these activities of the Signal Corps School. This presentation is entitled The Signal Corps School of Photography by Bucky Grimm. This will be a short history on the Signal Corps School, and this is based upon research that I have done as a part of a larger project on documenting lives and careers of cinematographers during the silent era. Pioneering cinematographer Carl Gregory was commissioned and assigned the role as one of the lead instructors for the school. He had been editor of a column on cinematography for Moving Picture World since 1915 and made mention of the role of the school in his column. At this point, Gregory mentioned that the Signal Corps was interested in recruits with some experience in the field. Gregory was a most interesting character as he was the first cameraman to film Under the Sea in 1914 the first cameraman for Technicolor in 1916. And as his life went full circle, he was the motion picture engineer at National Archives from 1939 to 1949. As the such was responsible for much of the policy and procedures for the division developed during that period. This is a portion of a brochure created by Carl Gregory to publicize the work and scope of the school. Some well-known names were involved in the school as either students or instructors. One of the more notable was Victor Fleming, who early in his career was a cameraman for Douglas Fairbanks, and he later became a director of such films as The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. You can see at the time it was called the School of Military Cinematography. As they branched out to include the still photo unit, they felt the name change was in order to reflect this.
Training for the recruits, as previously mentioned, was held at Columbia University in New York. Here you see views of some of the buildings used and were transitioned for barracks for the recruits. This image gives us a quick look at the room that was renovated into a still negative drying room for use by the school. There were instructors for all facets of the training, from motion picture camera operation, film processing, still photography, and editing. Shown here are some of the instructors and staff of the school. Here you see a couple of views of some of the recruits receiving training in the operation of a moving picture camera. They were required to learn all points of operation for the camera, from how the lens is operated to the internal unit of the camera, so they could break it down and rebuild it out in the field if necessary. The views here show recruits getting ready to travel to do some location shooting. They put their training to good use while still in the States, and they filmed many local events, such as victory parades and military training exercises. Here is a short video clip. It's about a minute and a half long which shows some of the Signal Corps unit performing some of the typical film-related tasks that they learned at Columbia. This is footage from Nara College Park out of the CBS collection. The original footage looks to have been called from some original Signal Corps material that also seems to have been used in some type of compilation. As these images show, the recruits were soldiers first, even though the primary focus was their training as part of the photographic unit. They were still required to perform the everyday duties of a soldier. At the beginning of the training for the Signal Corps recruits, they are also responsible for aerial photography. Uh, later, that was moved to a different location. But here are a couple interesting photos out of the collection that show instructor Carl Gregory getting ready to go up in a plane to shoot some footage on Long Island. To summarize, the school was established on January 1st, 1918 by the Army War College. Training took place at Columbia University in New York. The training consisted of a six week course covering still, motion picture, film processing and editing. The student capacity was 200 recruits. Upon completion of their training, soldiers were shipped as part of a divisional unit overseas to document war activities there. The divisional unit consisted of one officer and two enlisted men, and the school sent 38 divisional units overseas from completion of first training until the armistice was signed.
Hi, this is Jennifer Horn. I'm a professor of film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk today about textual records and government film. It's a really vital topic for scholars of non-commercial non film history, and I hope to give shape to this conversation in a couple of ways. My contribution to this panel comes from a larger, very long, simmering project on what I call civic cinema, non-commercial association or agency-based motion pictures engaged in any citizen-defining or citizen-excluding discourses of the administrative state, particularly where the management of biopolitics is concerned. As a starting place, though, I want to encourage us to think about the ubiquitous genres and subgenres of secretarial communication that reside in the folders and files we draw upon in our studies. As Lisa Gittleman shows in her masterful paper knowledge, documentary evidence of bureaucratic discourse hides in plain sight, seeing what it is that yokes together film viewing, ideas of civic improvement, and secretarial labor requires us to recognize the structure of job-printed modern documents. And as the anthropologist Matthew Hull expertly explains in his study of the state records of Pakistani bureaucracy, government of paper, scholars following Max Weber's description of bureaucracy have tended to flatly equate the writing that bureaucrats produce with the reality of institutions when really the very form of the documents and their graphic qualities also shaped the associations that constructed the inside and outside of state offices. In that way, textual records and manuscript collections aren't just a paper trail of this hygienic application of useful filmmaking, and neither do they provide us with the cultural context for American civic film practices. More than just how documents structure the labor of government workers, we are going to benefit from a more nuanced analysis of how the writing in these documents is fraught by what can or can't be said in a letter, on a spreadsheet, on an index card, or through a business form. Now, almost all government documents exist in a simultaneously rarefied and debased territory of print history, and no more so than the information pamphlet. And yet, as the material elements of civic instruction or health information campaigns, as we are very well aware right now in this pandemic, their value increases in ways that exceed their historical ephemerality. As the material evidence of bureaucratic life often handed out or made available in the realm of civic offices free of charge or deposited in federally mandated libraries for future reference, pamphlets are freighted with expressing the work of entire agencies. There's a connection here to unravel at a later time regarding legislation and funding of the government printing office during this period, which oversaw massive new printing requests requiring government contracts for pulp and paper milling, and how the GPO centralized printers and oversaw the standardization of prints and office forms that regulated government communication. Um, but my purpose here is to initiate a bibliographic understanding for motion picture documents that served to hybridize readership and spectatorship placing pamphlet films within the context of other U.S. designed iterative visual displays and printed material campaigns will, in turn, reveal the format-specific properties of civic address, linking the film to contemporary information gathering and to the simulacra of better civic life communicated by the printed government pamphlet's format. As examples of what I'm calling pamphlet films, and to explain why I see these films as a distinct subgenre of institutional filmmaking, I'd like to describe briefly the institutional context of four neonatal and postnatal hygiene films made for the U.S. Department of Labor between 1919 and 1926, Our Children, Well Born, The Best Fed Baby, and Sun Babies. Each of these films was conceived of as part of the dissemination of Children's Bureau print, brochure, and media displays. But I'll focus here on Our Children, a two-reel film 
that demonstrates to viewers how to organize and participate in a national campaign for birth certification. All four of these films, I should say, was, uh, were produced by the filmmaker Carlisle Ellis, who had a long history working with um, health uh, organizations and making um, uh, health information uh, films. Uh, our children, shot mostly in Gadsden, Alabama, during one of the Bureau's birth, birth certification public clinics, enacts aspects of public health activities that include physical examinations and also anticipates the need for women's club members to confront local male political leadership over resistance, presumably for reasons related um, to how race figured in the push for birth certification and the highly racialized discourse around infant survival rates, which is also shown in the film. The film's production was very much tied to the anticipated passage of the Shepherd Towner Bill of 1921, which addressed ma maternity care and sought to increase infant survival rates by providing governmental authorization of the types of massive public health campaign that the Children's Bureau had been working to introduce under the leadership of the celebrated Hull House alumni, Julia Lathrop. Our children reflected a new sentimentality around the bureaucratization of women's labor and sought to lend credibility to the communitarian claim that 11 million women participated in the national movement to improve children's health during wartime. The maternal and child health programs created by the Bureau were disseminated widely to state boards of health and loaned to clubs and community groups. The pamphlets, exhibits, displays, and films were created to support the agency's mission to evangelize its public about modern scientific child rearing, what was called child saving, um, in the first quarter of the 20th century. Although the Children's Bureau had only completed its first civil service examinations to hire its employees in late 1914, already by spring of 1915, the agency was distributing infant health slide lectures and a short film timed for the release of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. And continuity sheets for, for the leaders for that first visual project called A Day in Baby's Life suggested it began with the title, The Most Loving Act of a Mother is to Nurse Her Baby. This was consistent with the agency's postnatal and maternal health brochures um, that were disseminated at the time. After the success of this project, and newly flush with defense funding and allies in the White House, the emboldened U.S. Department of Labor agency was contemplating whether to add motion pictures to its next major campaign pushes for birth certification and to address the prevention of avoidable childhood diseases in high poverty areas. The year-long celebration of child health awareness in 1919 was called Children's Year with a multi-platform publication plan. The agency would distribute printed leaflets and pamphlets about measuring and weighing children, generate highly placed articles in women's magazines showing techniques of birthing, and send specially equipped American agitprop style trucks to deliver a spectacular baby special message to rural areas of the country. And Our Children, the film, captures a lot of that um, public uh, information campaigning. The Children's Bureau under Julia Lathrop was engaged in welfare programs on multiple fronts then, but it established its relevance on the national scene by undertaking large-scale and groundbreaking surveys of rates of morbidity among infants in the U.S. and its territories. Two early publications, Prenatal Care and Infant Care, epitomized the Bureau's approach to scientific motherhood. They set an advice manual tone between the agency and its aspirational public, translating horrifying statistics on, for instance, incidents of disability due to poor understandings of milk contamination into how-to format for the multilingual audiences of parents and childcare workers. These materials were the model for the films the agency produced and were the basis for critiques and admonishments handed over to Carlisle Ellis over the course of making the final cuts of these films. And what you saw in a loop here was just a minute from Best Fed Baby. So in closing, I just want to add that although it's very tempting to want to group these films together with instances of federal filmmaking, even <clears throat> from the Women's Bureau, which was 
and still is a part of the Department of Labor. I think uh, the media archaeological lens allows us to see these films as different, and I hope we'll have more time to talk about this. In closing, I just want to say that um, not only do we see in the Children's Bureau films a unique instance of government bureau filmmaking before the heyday of state documentary, but it also represented a distinctly transmedia approach to public information, and furthermore, as an instance of civic film production, one that was particularly attuned to the interests of women's clubs and community and professional organizations. The films made by the Children's Bureau speak to the uniqueness of the considerations of gendered knowledge in the public interest and uh, government and dissemination of films at the dawn of the information age. Hi there. Today I am sharing some research from an article I have coming out in the near future on a three-screen film that was made for and shown at the United States Pavilion at Expo 67. This is the United States Pavilion from the 1967 International and Universal Exposition, better known as the Montreal World's Fair or just Expo 67. The dome, created by R. Buckminster Fuller, is considered to be an architectural masterpiece and remains a symbol of its host city through the present day. The United States Information Agency, or USIA, was in charge of the American presence at Expo 67. In the center we have Jack Macy, who is a career diplomat and who served as Chief of Design for Expo 67, overseeing the design and operation of the American Pavilion. I am cutting out his fascinating backstory for time, but the success of the American presence at Expo 67 was largely due to his genius. He was responsible for hiring the other two people in the picture. On the right you can see Bucky Fuller in front of the entrance to the pavilion he designed. The person on the left is Ivan Chermayev, who was a member of design firm Cambridge Seven Associates, which was the company the USIA contracted with to oversee the creation of the exhibits inside the pavilion. The title of the film that was originally meant to be the centerpiece of the pavilion was A Time to Play. The director of the film is Art Kane, who was a renowned fashion and music photographer in the 1960s. I learned about the film quite by accident while looking through finding aids for paper-based records at the National Ar Archives for something else related to the United States Information Agency. I requested the relevant boxes on a whim, and while looking through some of the folders, I discovered that the USIA had produced a three-screen film for Expo 67. A quick online search revealed little information about it, and I wondered how it could have been effectively forgotten. After I tracked down a couple of contemporary reviews and dug deeper into the archival records, I found an answer. The film just wasn't much of a hit. Expo 67 had a wealth of innovative multi-screen films at its various pavilions. Many of these are documented in the brilliant book Reimagining Cinema, Film at Expo 67, edited by Monica Kingagnon and Janine Martisol. In the end, though, A Time to Play felt far weaker than these other works and was ultimately overshadowed and forgotten. But the backstory of how this happened is intriguing. The film itself and all of the documents that follow are from the collections of the National Archives, unless otherwise noted. Jack Macy was assigned to oversee the U.S. Pavilion at Expo 67 in 1964. The 1964-1965 New York World's Fair was active at the time, even though the USIA was not involved with this. One of the hits of the New York Fair was the multi-screen film To Be Alive by Francis Thompson and Alexander Hamid. Multi-screen films had been hits at prior World's Fairs, so having one as part of the American Pavilion at Expo 67 seemed like an easy decision. And hiring Thompson and Hamid straight off of a recent similar project was an obvious choice. Macy and his staff initiated conversations in October 1964. Thompson showed outright enthusiasm for this project and submitted several treatments about creative arts and artists in America. But as you can see from this memo for file by Macy, a few months later, Thompson also agreed to do a film for Canadian Pacific Railways. The USIA's contract had an exclusivity clause, since Macy wanted a unique work, not one of two films by a director. Canadian Pacific Railways offered a much larger budget, so Thompson and Hamid went with them, ultimately creating the hit multi-screen film We Are Young. A few days later, 
Macy was searching for a new director. He wrote a memo to his colleague and head of the motion picture division, George Stevens Jr. It simply read, A kooky thought. What do you think of the idea of getting Stanley Kubrick to do the great American documentary for the U.S. Pavilion at Montreal in 1967? Let's discuss when you have a minute. So, okay, it's easy to laugh at this. However, Macy was sending this note to the son of one of the other most famous directors in Hollywood history. Most of the major Hollywood studios were already cooperating with Macy's team on the American Cinema exhibit for the Pavilion as well. Many major artists, including Andy Warhol, would contribute works of art for display at the Pavilion. The Kubrick idea didn't go anywhere, but it isn't as far-fetched as one might think. On a similar note, Macy also wrote a memo for file with an idea for having five foreign directors, each do a short documentary with an outside view of what America is. The names he floated included Satyajit Ray, Federico Fellini, and Akira Kurosawa. The last line was, P.S. Funding for the above project would need to come from private sources. This remained a memo for file and resulted in no action. Soon after this, Macy ran across an article in the April 1965 issue of Harper's Bazaar about underground filmmakers. Looking for a filmmaker to deliver something truly cutting edge and unique, he contacted the Museum of Modern Art so that he and Ivan Chermayev could spend April 19th and April 26th watching works by the filmmakers mentioned in the article, along with some others suggested by staff from the USIA Film Division and MoMA. This is one of several sheets documenting what they watched, but the last column, with comments ranging from good cinematography to just dull, are transcriptions of Macy's originally handwritten notes. Chermayev requested prints of most of the films from the Filmmakers Cooperative in New York. Kenneth Anger actually included a two-page letter outlining his experience and expressing how eager he would be to make a film for the United States government's official pavilion at Expo 67. The fact that this was sent along with his queer classic Scorpio Rising seems surprising enough. But then, when Macy requested that certain prints be sent to Washington, D.C. to be screened for USIA staff as they discussed possible candidates, Anger made the final cut. The documentation ends there, and apparently the DC screening was the end of any discussion about Kenneth Anger. However, Jack Macy had been impressed by a film by photographer and filmmaker William Klein, who became the frontrunner. Macy's team reached out to Klein, who was unavailable. It seems worth noting that a few years later, Klein would direct his superhero satire of American imperialism, Mr. Freedom. Although his films weren't part of the MoMA screenings, Macy had recently seen Richard Lester's British comedy film, The Knack, or How to Get It. Lester was an American, but had developed his career in England. Having directed A Hard Day's Night the prior year, he seemed like a perfect choice for the culture of the time. However, he was preparing for his next Beatles film, Help. The backup plan was a little-known documentary filmmaker named William Friedkin. Although his documentaries are not particularly well-remembered today, Friedkin would go on to become one of the defining directors of the 1970s, helming The French Connection and The Exorcist. Friedkin agreed to the project and began working on a treatment. Much of his proposal mirrored what Francis Thompson had suggested, using the pavilion's broad theme of Creative America to focus on different artists. Keep in mind that this proposal was completed in December 1965, 14 months after Macy's team had initiated conversations with Francis Thompson. Jack Macy had near complete control over the American presence at Expo 67, but the one thing he could not fully influence was the budget. He could not make bureaucrats above him understand why the film should cost so much and, as such, he could not get a contract for Friedkin to sign, thus delaying shooting. William Friedkin walked away in April 1966, opting instead to direct his first feature film, the Sonny and Cher vehicle, Good Times. With time running short, Jack had an inspired idea. He reached out to photographer Art Kane, with whom he had served in World War II, to make his first film. Kane suggested several ambitious ideas. 
but he was suggesting these with a short production lead time. The one that seemed to stick was Games, later retitled A Time to Play. In the original treatment, the games in question were meant to show children playing as allegories for adult behavior and problems of modern society. The proposal suggested that, in a spiritual sense, we will see side by side the sense of hope and faith in our children and the feelings of despair and apathy in our adult society. As an example of these metaphors, the original treatment said that the game King of the Hill involves cunning, surprise, and strength, and can be likened to the assassination of Kennedy, the hanging of Mussolini, etc., or jumping rope, provides a sense of personal exhilaration that few games can offer. This would contrast to sorrows of man and man's inhumanity to man. Visually jumping rope relates to the calisthenics of fascist youth groups, and this might be incorporated. I can assure you that these subversive metaphors did not make the final cut. Although Macy had initially wanted something more edgy, my sense is the short production window that came from multiple directors backing out made it so that he primarily just wanted something that was done. And cutting out the controversial contrast before even the first shot was captured on film made that possible. In the end, the short production window resulted in a competent but rushed product. Jack Macy and Art Kane made what was simply a short film of children playing simple games spread across three screens. Again, I go into far more detail about this troubled production in my upcoming article. At the end of the day, Macy's work on the United States Pavilion was a massive success, but the film that was supposed to be its centerpiece made little impact, receiving not much enthusiasm or disdain. The documents about its production tell a far more interesting story of what could have been as Jack Macy spent years trying to make a powerful and subversive work that would have defied much of our framework for what a government film can be. Thank you. All right. Um, I think that we are ready for discussion. If anybody have questions, um, please drop them into the Q&A window. And do we have everybody back on screen? Um, just a quick note. So all of our panelists from the last few presentations are here, um, as well as Kate Brennan from the National Archives. So if you have questions for any of us, drop them in the box. Um, I do have a couple that came in by text message rather than the regular channel, so I want to bring that up real quick. Um, one comment that we have is just a piece of trivia. During the war, the National Archives moved all the film, or during World War II, the National Archives moved all of its film to Fort Hunt because it was mostly nitrate and therefore it seems safer not to have it in the same building with our paper records in case the Capitol came under attack. Um, so one very sh short question that I have, um, Bucky, would you mind talking a bit more about Carl Lewis Gregory and his connection to the National Archives? Sure, um, Gregory was originally a Actually, he started out working for government um, with the U.S. Geological Society, um, making lantern slides, learning how to, how to photograph, become a cameraman. He later went to Edison Studios as a, uh, he mainly handled special effects and a lot of films and directed a lot. And then Tannhauser. Uh, around the mid-20s, he started working more uh, doing patent research, developing cameras, developing optical printers, and things of that nature. And probably in the 30s, when archives was first starting up, uh, Greg Lee uh, was hired as a consultant on the survey of federal archives, and he helped survey all the motion picture materials and still images. Um, as they developed the division, uh, he got an early job as the motion picture engineer and uh, helped set up their motion picture division and helped out a lot at the Department of Agriculture in the 40s. 
He was actually the first person to successfully copy, uh, copy uh, Library of Congress paper prints. They were originally done over at National Archives. All right, great to know. Um, so a question that I have for Jenny, in some of the films that you have encountered about child rearing, have you noticed a considerable difference between films for white audiences and for black audiences? Thanks for that question, Brian. I haven't found in the case of the Children's Bureau that they, that they made films for separate audiences. Um, but in all of the, those four films that I was talking about, race is definitely a very tangible and um, important um, way for those films to address their audience. And um, uh, segregating the, um, the groups that are being addressed by those audiences within the films takes place in various ways. Um, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk about in my presentation has to do with the kind of outreach and the film, um, the recovery of data around how audiences understood those films. Um, the Children's Bureau sent out a number of employees on um, excursions around the American South and then up a little bit into Maine even um, to do sort of field research on what people saw in the films. And those trip reports exist in that record group and document different communities' responses to the films where race is definitely a factor and they talk about that in the trip reports. So it's, it's kind of integrated, and I guess this is relevant to my overall point about how paper is a component of how these films are made useful. The trip reports also set up a set of questions that then get fed back to the agency um, and yeah, I mean, race and um, the way that birth registration in particular is, is or isn't being embraced by various communities or is an obstacle to or, um, for the agency in various ways um, uh, is, you know, so it's definitely uh, legible in the documentation that exists in the record group of the Children's Bureau. Excellent. So I'm sticking with you for a moment, Jenny. A few questions have rolled in, and a few of them seem to overlap. There seems to be demand for you to elaborate on your fascinating concept of the pamphlet film and more of that definition and um, something kind of for everyone, too, of thinking of ways that film has parallels to other paper-based formats or to paper-based formats, rather. Well, that's great. So I'm, I am innovating a little bit with that term and I, as a neologism, and if it's something that people want to discuss in different ways, I, I've gone back and forth on whether I think these really are pamphlet films or whether they just reflect the way that the agency had started to use the structure of the pamphlet as a government document. But for me, the fact that those pamphlets are shown in the films, people are shown reading the pamphlets, and then even more important, the production documents that exist show that there was a lot of conversation and back and forth between Carlisle Ellis and the, um, the employees of the Children's Bureau, who most of them were, were women who had expertise in nursing or in public health or social, social work in general, um, they were working really hard to help Carlisle Ellis understand what kinds of intertitles those films would need. And they really wanted that language to come directly out of these brochures. This is why I think there's more there than just a sponsored film that is made for an agency. And there's a need for us to really think hard about how the paper document kind of comes to life in, in those films. And, and I don't know if that helps a little bit and I would love to hear from other people about whether they see in films that they've been looking at this kind of relationship between print and um, the, the structure of films. 
um, but you know, it's 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 a very enticing idea for me, and especially in these films that are silent, because so much of the film has to be communicated via text, and so it's logical to think about the way in which text structures the film and so forth. Right, and of course, um, thinking about how some of these materials are, if some of these films are related to textual materials. I've come across several educational films that have study guides, discussion guides, and so forth. And that's come up in some of the other panels that we've had so far. Does anybody, yeah, Kate, please. Oh, sure, yeah, I just wanted to add in there. Um, Jenny, I think that your research is fascinating. Um, and I think that we see in the textual records for some of these agencies and also for some of the, the State Department agencies like QSIA in later periods where mm -hmm. they're, they're going through trying to decide which films that they're going to use. Um, and the discussions that we see in those documents about, you know, what would this look like to an outside audience? What would this look like to a domestic audience? Um, I think that there are a lot of big questions there. Um, and the way that you, you're you using um, Women's Bureau and Children's Bureau um, films there is really fascinating. All right. Jenny, do you have anything else to add to that or? Well, for, uh, no, not at the moment. All right. And thank you, Kate. Yeah. So I have a question here for Nate. Could you talk about what, if any, links there were between the collection of films you discussed today and the films that the Western Allies requisitioned during European operations in 1944 and 1945? Um. Let me see, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a direct answer to that. Uh, one of the problems being that, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, um, films kept coming in to the Library of Congress, but uh, some of them shipped back from Europe. Uh, but I think that, that the, what was happening in Europe was almost completely separate from what was happening in the United States. Um, so from my understanding, what was going on was primarily a circulation of these films within the continental United States. Uh, if they were going to end up in Europe, they would have uh, gone to Hollywood to Capra's unit to be, uh, you know, to be spliced up and used in orientation and training films. Uh, but that's my understanding of it. Uh, I should also note that the um, my this research uh, uh, is really somewhat open ended in that uh, I, I kind of stumbled across uh, this information uh, and you know I I I, I think of about a decade ago uh, and all at the library most most of it at the Library of Congress uh, so there are a lot of um, loose ends so I can't really speak definitively to a lot of very specific questions. Uh, because as I mentioned, you know, one of the, well, as, as this, the theme of this conference kind of illustrates the, um, you know, bureaucracy produces a lot of paperwork and uh, that paperwork uh, exists, uh, you know, in collections, across collections. Um, and, you know, just, just even trying to get all of it or what you can find in order is kind of a massive task, which I think everyone here will agree with. So. Yeah, and something to kind of build on complicating the idea of government as a straight line. I have a question here. There seems to be an important pattern across all four papers about government collaboration with other non-governmental institutions and organizations. I am wondering if the panelists would like to say more about how to sort through the interface between governments and these other kinds of organizations. Were these relationships collaborative or were they more contested and complex? Well, I know early on um, when the government was starting to get involved in some filmmaking enterprises, I think the first film unit for the government was Department of Agriculture back in the earlier teens. Prior to that, uh, for a, a lot of that work, they contracted out to various studios. And I think one of the driving forces for them to get involved in that is they weren't happy. And there was a bit of at times a contentious relationship between them and the studios for the end product. Uh, not only cost being higher, 
um, but having more control over subject matter and, and, and results. So I think that that helped drive that that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, does anybody else have that? Jenny? Yeah, I can add just a little bit to um, this question, which is um, a really important question for us about competition and actually what government is at that moment. Um, in, in the case of the Children's Bureau, the what I observed in my analysis of their correspondence um, at the agency, and really this is 1914, 15, 16, the, um, the heads of the units in charge of public exhibiting and displays become um, very engaged in sorting through all of the various enterprises of film distribution and they're receiving correspondence or um, letters of interest and questions about film rental from a vast array of community um, uh, volunteer groups, um, clubs and public health departments across the United States. And so what you see back and forth, I would characterize more as sharing and collaborating as opposed to you know, being in competition with one another. But New York State um, seems to be very already on it in terms of how they wanna utilize um, the spaces of film exhibition for the pur pur purposes of health education um, and community engagement. So in, I mean, anyone is, who is interested in looking at this landscape, this, these early documents are just a, just a kind of plethora of letterhead that you could use to retrace these connections between um, what is officially government and what is kind of governing outside of the realm of government at that time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that these kinds of networks are collaborating at this point more than more than that. Later in the agencies, just a footnote, the, later in the period of um, Carlisle Ellis's engagement with the Children's Bureau, it does become competitive. And he does start writing to them and saying, can I have my negatives back? And, um, you know, I, I want to know how many times my films have shown for you. And then it sort of starts to get more complex with regard to the intellectual property and, and so forth. But early on, I think it's just open sharing of uh, resources around film. Absolutely. Yeah, and something that comes, I try to convey in my research on the USIA is a lot of people look at the government as a sort of homogenous thing with one main message, one force, like it's going to be highly organized and so forth. And that's not really true. As you go through the paper records, especially, you can see the influence of a lot of individuals, you know, a lot of bureaucrats along the line who are making personalized decisions, who are just going with a lot of things based on instinct and so on. And then it gets further complicated when you have different government offices having certain influences in culture. With the USIA, you have them contracting with individual filmmakers um, largely because they know that the filmmakers are going to go a little bit off of the intended project and come up with something of their own thing, but stick to kind of a core message. That going through the different records and looking at these collaborations, you can see a lot of variance in how things are done, what could have happened, different directions that projects could have taken. Um, any more thoughts, any more comments before we move off of those thoughts? Uh, yeah, I can, I can add a little bit there. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the interesting things about the period that I'm, I'm looking at, uh, which is the uh, about mid 1930s to the end of the 1940s uh, is that um, in, at pretty much all levels, uh, I'm both in terms of the government, uh, philanthropic organizations, private organizations, um, uh, filmmakers, film distributors, film exhibitors, is that it's actually a, a very small community, uh, even though it's spread across, you know, uh, it's worldwide, but 
um, there's a sense that everybody kind of bumps into everyone else. And um, so, for example, you know, one of the things that kind of smoothed relationships or kind of smoothed the way for relationships between the federal government and the Museum of Modern Art was, of course, that Nelson Rockefeller was the uh, head of the Office of Inter-American uh, Affairs, the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. Uh, uh, Archibald McLeish, the Librarian of Congress, is also a trustee of MoMA. So there are all these kinds of, and, and also what you see is that, um, you know, when you get to sort of the managerial level, you see um, them reaching out to a higher level to kind of bridge these, uh, um, bridge these institutional divides. Um, and I, I've, I've kind of, uh, I've, I've struggled with what to, what to refer this as because in some, in, in, in a sense, it's sort of a local community because so many of these people are based in New York. Um, and uh, if we go to the history of film studies, we look at Dana Poland's book on the early years of film studies is that he says that everything, everything that we see there is are these kinds of uh, isolated instances of, of film study that doesn't kind of coalesce into a, a dis discipline in which there's a sort of network of scholars. Um, but what's interesting is that looking at what's happening in New York and then what's happening in Los Angeles and in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. is that there's this kind of emerging uh, uh, well, it's not emerging because it's been there. It's it, it'd been there since the twenties of uh, of people really kind of taking on multiple um, multiple roles. So, for example, um, in another context, I've written about a, an exhibitor in New York named Arthur Mayer. Um, so, Mayer on one level was uh, a, a a film owner, and I mean a, a theater owner, and in kind of a uh, a theater impresario, but he was also deeply invested in the in the uh, uh, funding of documentary films. Uh, and during the war, he got he he went into government service. So when you're going through these these various collections, you'll see you'll see people pop up um, from. It's almost like they've kind of you, you see people pop up that sort of came in from another story. So all of a sudden, it's like there's something from Arthur Mayer or. Uh, a, another good example is uh, Tom Brandon, uh, who Tanya uh, is writing about. Tom Brandon shows up a lot. So this is really kind of a very uh, a, a loose community. And I don't want to say the film community because that sort of that sort of connotes Hollywood, but it's more like the film professional community, which kind of goes uh, across the spectrum from like uh, professional, like technical professionals to critics, to scholars, to like administrators. So it's it's something that's worth kind of thinking about how to kind of encapsulate that. Got it. Yeah, and sticking with you for a second, Nate, um, I have a question that's come in that I think would bounce off that well. A key variable in your paper is the influence of war for government interfaces with cultural institutions and the public. A lot changes because of that. Can you say more about war as a catalyst for these kinds of programs? Um or for catalysts is these kinds of programs. Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess to kind of reverse engineer and go back to the, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation's yeah. like role in, uh, in kind of providing the, the, the lion's share of money for the establishment of the um, film library, the Museum of Modern, of Modern Art. Uh, there's multiple kind of, uh, multiple uh, mandates going on in 1935 when MoMA is established. So on one hand, it has to do with, um, like Heidi Wasson's research has shown about the mass museology of uh, kind of bringing, uh, democratizing art for for the public, uh, making art accessible, making it uh, making it uh, or establishing, especially in terms of cinema, something that is that can be uh, that can be studied, that can be collected. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also uh, th uh, the emergence of. Uh, kind of critical communication studies that the Rockefeller Foundation is also funding at the same time. So they are kind of, it's sort of an economy of effort. So MoMA on it's sort of its primary mission is the public mission, sort of museum mission. Its secondary mission is to provide a base for film research that connects with radio research, newspaper research, print research, readership research uh, that's actually going on uh, in several other kind of uh, uh, Institutional context, so uh, and that and and the 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 impulse to uh, for communications research has a kind of uh, 
has has both uh, a dimension to it where it's about sort of making con- making the American public better consumers of the media, but also as a way of of spearheading communications research, particularly having to do with propaganda. So um, you know, trying to understand how you know that the, the United States will be part of the next war at some point, and it's better to be prepared even before. Uh, even before you know war has been declared, so um, a lot of that sort of baked into uh, the early history of the museum, um, and so what you see, especially in terms of them trying to collect films, uh, you know, trying to figure out where to put them, that all kind of uh, that all kind of originates with uh, the founding of MoMA. So there's a, there's a certain amount of um, you know sort of uh, of uh, you know taking imitation, uh, taking inspiration from from the con- MoMA of, the context of MoMA. Absolutely, and Jenny, you have something to bounce off that. Yeah, I just wanna ask me if you can talk a little bit about the, since we're talking about textual records um, and you spoke about customs documents, is, is anything kind of changing for you as a film researcer, as you start to work with these um, bureaucratic uh, forms and how they're filed. And I know, you know, much of what you talked about had also to do with the institutional cataloging of the films, but I'm particularly interested in the, the, the you know, the way in which a, a customs document, which is not the typical way that a film scholar begins to look at, at um, cir- film circulation. Can you talk a little bit about that form and what it's kind of done for you and re- helping you rethink the research you're doing? Yeah. Um, uh- Specifically, the vesting form that I, I posted. Um, you know, one of the things too is that you know when you do when you're in the archive and you're doing research uh, and you just have sort of a lead in terms of a box and you open it up and you start looking through it and you say, well, this is interesting. I have no idea what this is. That's a lot of the alien property custodian stuff is like that. I mean, it's as I mentioned, it's sort of like alien property custodian was more of a legal office. So one of the things that you can't see in the vesting order, which is actually three pages long, is that uh, you have to kind of learn learn what they're doing, but because it's so sort of ingrained in them, there's no there's no manual. So the vesting order is essentially it's not that they are do they have like investi- investigators in the field, you know, going to these warehouses and cataloging films. They're just pulling down the most recent uh, issue of the uh, Film Daily Yearbook opening it to German distributors and just basically making a blanket legal document that says everything that's described here, if it ex- if it's in the United States, it's ours now. So there's a, so it's, it's not, it's a very blunt instrument. Um, and so that, that I think kind of helps to contribute to the sort of confusion about what exists in these, coll- or existed in these collections uh, versus, you know, it's like, what did one office say it had versus what actually was there versus what the, you know, the workers at the National Archive and the Library of Congress actually found when they, you know, pried open these boxes of film. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're like two or three completely different ideas about what they are. Um, so I think that for myself, the, the challenge uh, in, this, in this particular, like dealing with the bureaucratic aspect uh, has to do with the sort of, um, you know, seeing a lot of documents and then trying to abstract, you know, say like this document is like this document, this document. So, you know, it's, um, and then, and then also seeing how, uh, you know, the, the sort of the rhetoric changes from office to office. Um, and, you know, as, as, as everyone knows, it's an ongoing process. So, uh, but, but it's, it's sort of, I guess it sort of teaches you to learn on your feet when you're actually in the reading room. <laughs> All right. Sounds great. Um, So a question came in for me. Um, You noted some of the critical response to A Time to Play. Was the film discussed in comparison to the Canadian multi-screen films at Expo 67, which, as you know, were a watershed moment for the development of what would come to be known as IMAX? Yeah, so these other pavilion films at Expo 67, like I said, there's this wonderful book um, on all these different multi-screen films and some of the experiments and so on. And the US, their plan was for this film to be the absolute centerpiece of this pavilion. It just happened that everything else at the pavilion worked well enough that the film kind of flopping didn't really affect anything. They had a beautiful pavilion. They had wonderful displays of modern art 
um, moon landing stuff and so on. So nobody really noticed that the film flopped. But there was a review of all the different multi-screen films at Expo 67 that was written by Judith, Shat Judith Shatnoff for Film Quarterly in 1967. And I have this sentence for it. She was left with, quote, the impression that a time to play should be advertising something, perhaps milk. It had that glossy commercial quality. There were more interesting ex explorations of multi-screen to be seen at Expo. For instance, We Are Young. And then she goes on to absolutely rave about We Are Young, which of course was made by Francis Thompson and Alexander Hamid, who had a contract with or I think they had a contract that wasn't signed yet with the USIA to make a film for them. And then Canadian Pacific Railroads offered considerably more money that Jack Macy, he kept trying to fight for an actual decent budget and all these fights, it just left him not being able to get a filmmaker in place. Um, it's why William Friedkin walked away and we almost had a World's Fair film by the director of The Exorcist. But um, in the end, you know, he got his photographer buddy who he could grab and said, let's make something. But just with the lead time, they weren't really to do much, able to do um, that much to innovate. And it was just kind of there. Um, so I want to take a second. We've talked a lot about digging into paper records. And I'd like to ask Kate if you could talk a bit about starting research and, um, into some of the paper records at the National Archives. Sure, yeah. Um, well, listening to all of your presentations was really interesting. Um, and I did think that there were you know, lots of places where researchers can start um, doing research like this. Um, USIA obviously has one of the, the strongest collections on um, on movies, on film, um, anything that they wanted to broadcast to the world, um, you know, there's a there's almost a file on. Um, so we have researchers who write in um, looking for, you know, films that, you know, black and white films that, that we might think about like as pop culture. Um, and I'll be like, hmm, there really be a file on this? Of course there's a file on it. Um, because how would this test, you know, to the world? Um, but when I was um, going through um, all of your um, and thinking about all of all of these presentations, uh, you know, we have FBI and justice records that have, you know, case files talking about uh, people who were involved in making films um, and involved in the film industry um, at times when, you know, things became uh, more sensitive. Um, so all, lots of filmmakers um, are going to be in, in these records. Um, the German captured records. Um, obviously, we have the films that Nate talked about, um, but there's also um, a ton in RG131. Um, someone dropped into the comments um, one of the links to the vesting orders for the alien property case files, um, and I think that those are a great a great place to start. Um, there's also a collection of um, German and American Vocational League Boone films. Um, that are the textual records that go behind, um, you know, the things that that the Bund was working on, um, and I think that a lot of researchers find a lot of um, of useful material there. Um, Signal Corps came up in several of these, um, and Signal Corps was just so incredibly in, invested and involved in both the photography and the motion picture side um, of of this. Um, I can drop some some links into the the chat. Um, on places to start, um, because obviously, if they're they're using these these films um, and creating schools of photography, they're also you know they're keeping records on that. Um, so in RG one eleven, um, there's a lot of material that researchers who are just getting started on projects, or even if you're you know you're pretty deep into what you're looking at on um, an audio visual side or photography, um, I think that you would find a lot of records um, on um, you know on these topics. Um, and obviously, um, you know, central files for Women's Bureau, Children's Bureau, um, even State Department. Um, 
and not on any you know specific topic um, that I want to call out, but everything. Um, anytime that you know the the U.S. and the world is is at play, um, the State Department's talking about you know the the films that are being broadcast, um, the pamphlet literature even um, that's being circulated in the U.S. Some of that's being circulated abroad too. Um, so copies would go to state, copies would get sent to posts. Um, so you never know what you're gonna find. Um, and one of the, my favorite parts of like working on site with researchers, which obviously this year has been a little bit rough, um, is you know, people going through those boxes and, and finding those, those exciting documents that, you know, why is this here? Why are they talking about it? Um, and then, you know, piecing that story back together. Absolutely. And so we're about to segue into a short break and then we will have um, our panels on doing research at the National Archives. But I think that it would be good if each of us on um, who had presentations on the panel talked about a little bit about our experiences with archives and archivists helping us out with our research. And I think that'd be a good way to close. So um, if you don't mind me starting with this, I'd like to say for my presentation, I found this Expo 67 stuff by chance. I thought it looked neat. I requested it. Um, I was already requesting a bunch of other boxes. So it's like, hey, why not? And, you know, there's been a lot of mention of paper trails and so on. This wasn't really a trail. It was like three or four thick folders that I just went through. And I'm like, all right, what in the world is happening here? Because I'm reading this story about a mess that was just coming through from all the documents were in reverse order. So I'm seeing it come from this film happened and it was just okay back to, all right, this is how much work we went to to get a film that wasn't that exciting. So I went up to the motion picture room and I put in a request for, um, to see if I could get a copy of this film or see if I could find it. It wasn't in the catalog. So I started to talk to, um, the reference staff there. And I shot an email to Audrey and Heidi, who are a couple of my co-organizers on this and work in the film lab, like, hey, um, is there a chance that this is floating around? And I actually did a conference talk years ago on this missing USIA film. And a couple months later, the film shows up. It's just that there's still records that are being processed, that the films are being processed. And there's a staff member at National Archives, Mike Taylor, who has just done this Herculean effort to get through these USIA films since, you know, they were never classified, but they were not available on US soil until the early 90s. And then not much happened with them for a little bit. Mike's just been going through and getting them ready. So thanks to the lab, they were able to transfer that once Mike um, put it in the catalog. And shortly after I had a copy of it, I somehow got contacted by Art Kane's son, like, hey, I heard that you found this or that you did a conference paper on it. Do you happen to have this? And that was like a week later after they got me the digital copy. So I was able to reunite that. So if anybody else wants to comment on their experiences in archives. Sure, yeah. Um, I've, I've gone to, to NARA for a buku number of years, especially in College Park. Um, and, you know, it's been a big help from the, the research associates and things there to kind of narrow my focus down. You know, it's one thing if you're looking for something and a lot of times, you know, a lot of us aren't exactly sure what we're looking for. We know the basic subject matter, but exactly where to find it tends to be difficult. And they're critical in narrowing down that focus. Now, one of the things you mentioned about the missing USIA film, um, one of the things I found over time is you're kind of at the mercy of who entered the record originally, because it's been entered, you know, especially if something's gone back to the 20s, it's been re-entered Lord knows how many times. And as you re-enter it every time, the person who enters it has a different format and a different style as to how they enter it. So it, uh, it makes you kind of 
uh, open up a little bit more to expand in the way you research and change the way you think uh, and, and not always accept that, you know, what you're looking for isn't there. You have to kind of uh, dig a little bit deeper and kind of put the puzzle pieces back together. Absolutely. All right, Jenny. I can, yeah. I can just jump in and say, I mean, my debts are huge to uh, the reference staff at um, National Archives. And I know Carol Swain is in the participants list. And early on, Carol uh, answered a number of my questions. I wouldn't have gotten very far with the American Red Cross records um, or the Children's Bureau without contact. Uh, and I think also with USIA. But, um, but I will just make mention of the fact that with a lot of these organizations which were massive and had secretaries secretarial staffs that created early organization systems it's it, it's really critical to work with someone in the reference room because what you're looking at is both the original departmental organization of those records, and I guess this is kind of echoing what, what Bucky's just said, ingested into the National Archives and then in some ways reorganized for the purpose of, um, you know, separation and management within the textual records and still photography division and the motion picture area. So you kind of need a dual lens when you look at these documents and you want to be paying attention to the sort of origination um, structure as it's then mimicked in the National Archives own way of organizing materials. And I don't think one should rely on their own gut <laughs> to, yeah. to do that. You really need to reach out to the reference staff and they can help you in, in immense um, uh, ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, let me see. Um... Yeah, yeah. I, the uh, reference staff is indispensable, um, and I, I kind of, I, as we're talking, I, I just kind of want to shout out the the staff at the Rockefeller Archive Center in Terrytown, uh, uh, in uh, up in the Hudson River Valley. Um, if you have anything to do with uh, with Rockefeller philanthropy, I, I strongly encourage you to reach out to them to go up there. Uh, it's in a, it's literally in a mansion on a hill. And it's the only archive I've ever been to where they actually provide you with snacks, like a fully stocked uh, uh, kitchen. Um, and you know, kind of to to, to kind of uh, bounce off of something that Jane just said, one of the things that's that's interesting that we, you know, that 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 it's good to kind of bear in mind is is again like what is is the try to re to is, is to try to reconstruct the the original, you know, the original business filing system or to understand, you know, how these documents get produced. So, you know, it, it's like to go with the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, you know, I, I've i looked at thousands of documents from the Rockefeller Archive Center and they are impeccable. You know, they are, they're formatted perfectly. Uh, there's very, very few typos. And that's all because of the, of the secretarial pool. Um, and you can really tell the difference, uh, although you might tend to overlook it when you come across someone's, uh, someone's correspondence and they open it by saying, I'm sorry, my secretary isn't here today. So I'm typing this myself. And it looks like it's from the, it looks like it's from the typewriter, right, typewriter of a madman. Like it's just, you know, the, every, it's just the, 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 uh, indents are all wrong. Everything's, everything's a mess. Um, and you see that in, and you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, there's something too about the different kinds of uh, the the materiality of the documents themselves, whether or not they're carbon copies or their photo stats or their original doc or the, like the original documents. Um, you know, one of the another kind of example of how these things sort of end up kind of spread 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 out across uh, different archives is that um, I uh, a couple summers ago I was in Los Angeles and I came across uh, a uh, I came across some some very minor correspondences from the from the film critic and sociologist Siegfried Krakauer in a collection I wasn't expecting to find, and I found like his in, an inscribed letter from him, and I realized that I had seen the first I had seen the carbon copy of it 
in the German literature archive in Marbach. So I, so, you know, how they ended up, one of them ends, ends up in Marbach. It's written in New York. The other one's written in New York and eventually makes its way to Los Angeles. And uh, it's interesting. You, you can kind of piece together how that happened because essentially what had happened was that uh, the, the, the person to whom the letter was written basically gave this material to this other person who then donated it, whose widow then donated it to UCLA. Um, and that's just kind of an you know, that, that's the sort of backstory of the correspondence, which in, in and of itself is not particularly germane to anything except for the way that these documents kind of travel and kind of end up in different places. Um, and I think that's something that I've thought about particularly de dealing with bureaucratic history uh, is that, um, you know, sometimes documents or letters are not sent or you find drafts, but you don't find the the sent version. Uh, and that that may tend to kind of overly complicate things, but they also help us better understand how uh, how these institutions worked as organizations, like how they, you know, how they kind of uh, distributed their own knowledge or kind of communicated with one another. Um, so that's uh, my takeaway from that. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're a little bit over time. I promise I won't take much more as I wrap us up. If we were to, I think that especially the four presenters who are here on this specific panel um, were to go into how our research ha is massively indebted to archivists. We would not get out of the here today if we did our full conversation. And again, I'm grateful for Kate Brennan for joining us um, as our arch archives representative from the National Archives too. Um, the work that archivists do in making sure that records reflect these organizations, that they reflect how things actually operated, how they use principles like original order and provenance to make it so that we are able to trace these concepts. I think that there's often among researchers not enough credit for just how much of the work is already done for us when we show up to do this research, how much we're able to trace it because an archivist is good at their job. And speaking of archi archivists who have been very good at their job, um, we would not have been able to do this conference without the staff of the National Archives. Um, there are too many people to miss, but many of them have been on the program throughout this conference. And there were many others behind the scene. So I would like to thank everybody for coming. And if you stick around in 26 and a half minutes, we will have the workshops on how to do research on film related matters at the National Archives. So please stick around for that. Thank you very much.